My presentation today is going to be on uh, how corporations have effectively hijacked the U.S. Constitution, our very like constitutional rights, uh, in order to thwart environmental justice and prevent us from uh, actually protecting our planet and our communities uh, and sustain ourselves uh, against the harms of corporate power, such as cell phone companies. One of the things that got me inspired with it within this group is that uh, this is a coalition of more than 500 organizations and hundreds of thousands of individuals, 460,000 individuals who are supporting this uh, and are committed to uh, justice and equity, uh, not just uh, so politically, but socially, economically, and ecologically, um, uh, ending corporate rule and actually creating a genuinely vibrant democratic society. As I was mentioning, uh, we are a national coalition uh, of hundreds of organizations and, over, and hundreds of thousands of individuals uh, working to uh, end corporate rule. Uh, we're committed to justice and equity and uh, creating a genuine uh, democratic society that is actually representative and accountable to all people regardless of race, gender, or class uh, and not just corporate uh, interests or profit motives. So Move to Amend's goals uh, in order to accomplish this vision uh, is to amend the U.S. Constitution to unequivocally state that corporations, artificial entities created by state law, are not people with the same constitutional rights as human beings, and that money is not equal to protected political speech, uh, meaning that we can actually regulate it within our political processes. Uh, in order to do this, we need to build a powerful grassroots movement that is multi-ethnic, intergenerational, uh, and cross class uh, democracy movement that, cross, that transcends uh, and goes across the intersecting issues and oppressions that we struggle with daily. Uh, we also, uh, to do this, we're seeking to provoke discussion and organizing around how uh, to transform the current system into a genuine democracy that's rooted in justice and equity for all, based on our key democratic uh, values and the values of our communities. So just to frame the big picture of why, uh, why this movement and why we're seeking to uh, carry such a heavy lift of amending the Constitution. Uh, first and foremost, uh, how many people here are familiar with the Supreme Court decision, Citizens United versus Federal Election Commission? Okay, most of you, or all of you, uh, are familiar with that decision. Uh, and while there have been a lot of organizations and a lot of calls to overturn this one court case, it actually goes much deeper than Citizens United, uh, which was uh, the court decision that came out in 2010, and actually goes much further back than just 2010. Uh, for example, campaign the campaign finance system that we have in this country has long allowed uh, corporate donors uh, to control government policies to enrich themselves, uh, which is why wealthy owners and their corporations are spending, have been able to spend billions of dollars uh, in electoral influence for generations, costing up, like, which is why we see uh, multi-billion dollar election cycles each and every year. Um, and from what we like, from the funding that we know about, uh, they use this to uh, basically prop up incumbent legislators for decades on end, uh, keeping them in power so that they vote in favor of their interests that benefit their bottom line. Um, and this is result. Like, we actually see this in uh, even recent studies uh, at the highest in Ivy League schools uh, that have found that outside campaign donors actually have three times as much access as uh, their own constituencies uh, that these incumbent legislators represent. And if that weren't bad enough, uh, all of these elite political donors, of which are basically the one percent of the one percent, uh, are almost exclusively white. Uh, it's white men in particular, uh, with over 63% uh, of political contributions coming from men uh, and over 90% of them coming from white people overall. Uh, where the U.S. population only has 3% millionaires, they actually represent uh, more than 45% uh, of all political donors in the United States. So just to give it a quick example of like where we see this money being concentrated in, look no further than Richmond, California, which is positioned within the Richmond refinery, uh, the Chevron uh, Richmond refinery, which is also known as the Ring of Fire, right? Um, the, like for many years, uh, this community, which is uh, particularly in North Richmond, which is predominantly a community of color, uh, has long struggled with uh, toxic air pollution, uh, ongoing, like, you know, uh, eruptions and flares coming from this facility that uh, cause people to have to stay indoors, destroy local uh, uh, plant life and wildlife, um, and just create an overall toxic haze across the, the entire Bay Area, not just in Richmond. Um, and this corporation, Chevron and uh, the five other uh, major fossil fuel refineries, spend heavily 
uh, within Bay Area local politics, uh, particularly within uh, the Richmond City Council elections where uh, they, uh, they have been known to spend as much as $7 million in just a local race by itself. Um, good news is, with people power, we've been able to actually uh, overcome that, uh, that seven to one advantage uh, and have actually managed to get out most of uh, Chevron's uh, paid for representatives uh, in the city council. Deeper than just how much, like the current campaign finance system, dirty money in politics we know has been a problem uh, long since Citizens United, long before Citizens United. But what's even bigger of a problem is our profoundly undemocratic system where we have uh, significant barriers to voting and political participation, where millions of people are effectively barred from even participating in the process because they were uh, convicted of uh, even nonviolent crimes uh, and other uh, voter ID laws that are passed within uh, as much as 33 states across the country, and of course, uh, elected uh, incumbent officials who continue to uh, restructure districts through gerrymandering uh, and then purging voter rolls uh, in order to dilute community power to, keep, uh, to put them out of office when they don't represent them. Uh, worse than that, there has also been a profound lack of representation in all levels of government, literally from the beginning of the, of the United States. Uh, where the U.S. population of over 325 million people uh, is, a, uh, is proportioned at 52% women and 39% people of color, and yet more than 70% of all elected uh, U.S. office holders are men, 90% of them are white, and 65% of them are white men. So this, and this has been true and even worse uh, since the founding of this country. We see the results of this uh, lack of representation in the policies that are enacted uh, in communities, uh, in majority communities of color. Uh, in places like Detroit and Flint, Michigan. In Detroit, uh, the city, like an unelected financial man manager, thanks to a predominantly white uh, Michigan state legislature, um, uh, effectively uh, cut off water supply to over 300,000 people uh, and forced them to uh, pay up on, uh, on unpaid water bills, despite the fact that many of the corporate investors within the city uh, had the same level of unpaid water bills, but were actually uh, over unpaid for in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, and they were allowed to, of course, continue having their water access while uh, de like water uh, district managers and such were going door to door, house to house, shutting off water supplies, uh, forcing the community to actually take their own action and prevent these water cutoffs, which the U like, even the United Nations declared was a violation of our basic right to water, our, our basic human right, and, a and this is a crime against humanity. And Flint, Michigan, of course, uh, we, we've heard the toxic level of uh, lead contamination uh, that poisoned uh, hundreds of thousands of people, uh, particularly children, which, uh, for those who don't know, there is no cure to lead damage. Like, that is a permanent fixture within uh, tens of thousands of kids' lives, and there are still tens of thousands of residents in Flint who are, uh, who are still having to depend upon bottled water because their water systems have not been fixed. Beyond just uh, this... Uh, you know, how much money is in politics uh, and the undemocratic nature of our system, we have to really look at how this system was founded and notice that the undemocratic system that we are living in was rooted in a corrupt culture prioritizing property over people and the environment. Um, we have to acknowledge that the US, United States, uh, stole, like the land that we live on, is completely stolen from its indigenous inhabitants. Uh, and we were founded basically upon a, a policy of genocide, land theft, and human slavery within a legal framework. Um, and through this uh, framework and this founding, uh, corporate power, the wealthy owners of, our, of the corporations, even the ones that we see today like Chevron, uh, have built their wealth on centuries of reckless extraction and uh, malicious exploitation of the most vulnerable and marginalized communities among us, particularly communities of color where corporate polluters locate uh, along uh, in mostly low income communities and communities of color uh, because as they found, Due to a lack of political economic resources and voter suppression tactics, uh, race is one of the single biggest determining factors for constructing toxic waste facilities in the United States. Uh, furthermore, beyond just uh, this entirely, uh, 
this rampant environmental racism, uh, our profit-driven policies that prioritize business interests over basic human need um, enable frequent environmental disasters, both natural and man-made, uh, where communities of color are typically the most impacted and take the longest to recover over uh, affluent white communities. Look no further than places like Standing Rock, North Dakota, where um, the state capital, Bismarck, was originally slated to take in the Dakota Access Pipeline. Um, uh, that was the original proposed route, it was supposed to go through the city, but the predominantly white city of Bismarck voted against that and said, no, we don't want this dirty pipeline uh, pushing in this horrible uh, product of fossil fuel through our city. So what did uh, energy transfer partners do? They decided to relocate through in sovereign indigenous territory, despite the fact that the 1851 Treaty of Laramie explicitly prohibited such practices without the consent of the indigenous nations there. Um, the federal government, of course, approved it. Uh, the courts uh, eventually some, uh, have been pushing back and they've been making uh, some victories since, but uh, that still, uh, they were allowed to complete uh, most of the construction that goes under uh, a major water supply that uh, supplies up to 10 million people, both white and, like, white and of all colors, basically. And of course, this was uh, the, the state police of North Dakota uh, effectively enforcing that and also attacking unarmed uh, women and children um, uh, who were just praying and fighting and working to protect their sovereign territory and their water supply for millions of people. Most recently, uh, just a couple years ago, Puerto Rico. Uh, the hurricane disaster that happened there uh, under the Trump administration uh, is, just a nat uh, is a natural disaster that has been fed by our reckless extraction of fossil fuels and destruction of our environment. Uh, and this in Puerto Rico, being that it is a U.S. territory, which is effectively means that it's a colony, um, major corporate uh, major corporate investors within the island who are basic who have been pillaging uh, Puerto Rico's economy for uh, centuries, or, or I'm sorry, not for that century, but well, actually, yeah, over a century, uh, have effectively been starting to collect due and taking advantage of this uh, natural man-made disaster uh, or, or natural disaster to uh, effectively privatize essential government services like their electric systems um, and even their education systems and so forth. Um, in leaving tens of thousands of people without water and basic uh, other basic necessities for months at a time and uh, also ignoring the fact that uh, thousands, over 4,000 people, not uh, you know 60 or l barely 100 that were listed as the official uh, casualty rate by the U.S. government, thousands of people were killed by this storm and the, gov and the U.S. government refused to acknowledge it. And of course, uh, white communities are not uh, protected against Mother Nature, of course. Most recently, Paradise, California, PG&E, one of their outdated electrical systems effectively started the fire that destroyed uh, an entire community in California and killed more than 85 people. Friend, I had friends uh, and their families who lived in that, uh, who, li who lived in that had to escape that and saw people die from this, all because uh, one private electrical company uh, would like didn't want to spend the money to update upgrade its electrical infrastructure. So how did this happen? Basically, a series of Supreme Court decisions dating back all the way um, to the eight, or to the 19th century uh, have effectively expanded uh, what is known as corporate personhood uh, to include the same inalienable constitutional rights as you and me. These include rights under the first, fourth, fifth, and fourteenth amendments. They even have uh, certain rights held under the Commerce and Contracts Clauses, basically making them uh, not only uh, unaccountable to elected government, but also uh, exceptionally more powerful than any human being or our communities. How do they use their constitutional rights? Effectively to uh, overturn locally enacted regulations and protections, no matter how popular they are. Uh, they use their uh, money, which is considered a form of protected political speech, thanks to the Supreme Court, uh, to influence legislators and voters uh, using uh, model legislation uh, that they push through uh, nonprofit organizations uh, like ALEC, um, and also uh, buying political ads, which they spend millions, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars on uh, in each election cycle, as they are right now. And they threaten local and state governments with expensive lawsuits, creating a chilling effect where even the most, uh, or even the most independent uh, of legislators uh, and committed uh, 
social justice activists can't, get through, uh, can't overcome a uh, the threat of a corporate lawsuit in order to pass popular legislation. And this all ties back into our founding culture's focus on property and profit that, was ma uh, that made this all easy. In order to really understand what, like how we got here today, we really need to go back to the founding of this country. So this is the democracy that we envisioned and that was sold to us by the framers of the Constitution, the founding fathers, and so on. Uh, we the people are free and sovereign because we hold all the political power, but we delegate some of our power to government that is subordinate and accountable. We assign government duties, which they discharge by writing laws in the public interest, but no law can violate the private rights of individual citizens. Who here believes we actually practice that in this country? <laughs> exactly. Unfortunately, this is the reality that we actually live here in the United States. Uh, the Constitution, as it was written in 1789 by the founders, uh, was in fact a property rights document that basically added human rights as an afterthought. The first ten amendments, the Bill of Rights. But even with those paltry few rights, of which they eliminated uh, on another 150 or so uh, that were originally proposed, uh, there was no definition of who was a person worthy of constitutional protection, effectively allowing uh, for governments at all levels to exclude the vast majority of citizens, women, black, brown, and indigenous people of color, even impoverished white men uh, who didn't own property, and everybody who was under the age of 21, effectively had no uh, sovereign rights under the Constitution. Uh, furthermore, there were no protections of nature and no obligation whatsoever to uh, guarantee uh, a sustainable environment uh, in order to secure the blessings of liberty that were enumerated uh, in the preamble of the Constitution. But even though, despite all these profound flaws, there was absolutely no mention of corporations anywhere within the founding text. Not even within the next 27 amendments that came after that. In order to understand why this is such a big deal, uh, we really need to understand the difference between a corporation and a person. So the obvious difference, One's artificial, one's completely naturally made. We have to look to, uh, to uh, what is the definition of legal personhood, also known as corporate personhood, which was established even before the US was founded uh, in English common law, and it's been enshrined in state law ever since. These are effectively, legal personhood includes the legal rights, uh, statu which are known as statutory rights, uh, which are legal privileges used to perform certain functions as a single entity. This includes uh, the power to enter into contracts, to own property, to sue and even to be sued as a single entity and is uh, effectively gives limited liability for the investors, the people who put money into the organization that is a corporation. But even in the founding father's time, this was always understood to be a privilege, not an inherent right, and there was never any debate among the founding fathers of what the nature of a corporation was. They always understood it was meant to be subordinate and accountable to we the people. It was an institution of government. Human rights are a completely different matter. Uh, we all have natural rights, civil rights, political rights, economic rights, because we exist as living, breathing human beings. We said that we have these rights, therefore we do. And what the Constitution is, the constitutional rights that we uh, are cur currently have, are basically statements of principles that have enshrined the human rights that we have retained among ourselves. And constitutional rights serve as a restraint on the use of government powers, meaning that whatever uh, authority, like whatever duty that we have tasked them with, they cannot violate uh, the essential in inherent human rights that we have enshrined within our founding document. It's a, a clear statement of principle, and even those rights that are not explicitly enumerated are still protected, thanks to our Ninth Amendment. Now, this framework worked just fine uh, for uh, the first century or so of, like, of our nation. Uh, corporations prior to 1886 were held to a much stronger account, uh, level of accountability. Uh, for instance, the whole incorporation process, creating the corporate charters, uh, had to be approved uh, by, state, uh, by the state legislature creating a law that had to be signed by the governor, uh, and that charter, that law that they created, uh, had, what, had to be limited in its duration, typically existing no longer than 50 years, uh, and it had to have a, a clearly defined purpose that served the public benefit. Uh, furthermore, and most importantly, it was prohibited from participating within the political process, as seen in an example in the Pennsylvania Constitution back in the 1850s, uh, where it explicitly gave the legislatures the power to revoke, alter, uh, or to alter, revoke, or even annul any corporate charter if it violated their laws or harmed their communities in any way. And this could actually happen before 1886. Fast forward to today. 
The, the process of incorporation is significantly easier. Basically, in order to become a corporation, all you need to do is pay a small fee, about $250 or so, to a state law clerk, and you get your papers, your corporate charter, and you can basically do anything you want. There is no purpose that needs to be defined or, uh, or limited you to in your activities, meaning that you can be the, uh, the next Amazon or next Google or Apple or whatever you want to be, and there's literally no uh, duration on that. The only purpose that you are constrained to is one. Corporations exist to maximize the wealth and profit of their shareholders. Thanks to uh, the State Supreme Court of Michigan in uh, Dodge versus Ford in 1919, which effectively allows corporations to externalize the costs of doing business onto our communities, particularly the most marginalized and vulnerable communities among us. It enables greater disparities in pollution exposure and environmental damages and widens inequalities across the board. Um, and of course, this, uh, the current nature of, corp of the incorporate corporation process uh, allows no limit for on political participation, furthermore so thanks to the Supreme Court. So we know the corporations of course don't get sick, they don't go to jail, they don't have children or anything like that that human beings actually need, yet they will use their money and their rights to oppose basic social safety services, uh, social services, uh, health care, education, even protecting our environments and our communities from, uh, from public harm. Unless of course these services can be provided by the corporation themselves, which they try to do through privatization, of course. So how did this all, how did this framework get completely messed up? Basically, thanks to uh, an error in uh, the uh, Supreme Court uh, here in California, Santa Clara County versus Southern Pacific Railroad of uh, 1886. Uh, now this case didn't explicitly involve the 14th Amendment. What it was, was that the Chief Justice at the time opened oral arguments to basically uh, state this quote, that corporations uh, are protected under the 14th Amendment's uh, Equal Protection Clause. Um, so they didn't want to hear the lawyers argue uh, whether or not they were protected by the 14th Amendment. They were, were all of the opinion that they were, that they were protected. But this decision uh, wouldn't have been made, uh, wouldn't have been possible and added into the official record had it not been for one rogue court clerk, uh, a man by the name of Bancroft Davis, who just so happened to own his own uh, for-profit railroad company, um, who added this, uh, this statement into the official court opinion as a head note. And then, uh, barely two years later, the Supreme Court actually found in 1889 Minneapolis and St. Louis uh, Railroad Company uh, versus Beckwith that a corporation is a person uh, with both due process and equal protection rights under the 14th Amendment. And because that was enshrined within an official court opinion, this opened the door for corporations to claim all manner of uh, human rights protected under the constitutions, as we'll learn uh, here shortly. But it didn't end there. Uh, and uh, the Supreme Court continued to use the 14th Amendment to uh, in what it created known as uh, its substantive due process doctrine to effectively overturn more than 200 uh, popularly enacted legislation uh, w uh, during the Depression era and w uh, leading in through that. Uh, the corporations have been able to use the 14th Amendment to, to claim equal protection status so that they are not treated differently from small locally owned uh, businesses and corporations that are created such as the mom and pop shops. This effectively means, with the 14th Amendment, they can create uh, chain stores upon chain stores throughout end and basically push all manner of local mom and pop shops out of business. They can erect cell phone towers against the popular will of the communities because they're like they can't, they, they're entitled to due process. Uh, and no regulation uh, that is passed can violate those due process rights of the corporation or their equal protection status as equal citizens. So if they are based within this particular community and they want to advocate for a cell tower to get put up, they can affect, they have to be treated the same way as any other citizen uh, or community, regardless of how much uh, money that we have, of course. Uh, and uh, they can effectively thwart any kind of uh, democratic measure for corporate mergers, such as the AT&T and Time Warner merger and such. Furthermore, uh, for, under the Fourth Amendment, corporations have been able to claim uh, immunity against searches and seizures of their books, records, and other property, um, basically making it so that no corporate practice or um, trade secrets can be revealed uh, in a court of law that might, even if they violate uh, our basic laws or um, standards of decency. And they've used that to disastrous effect. Uh, 
uh, and, and can, this is uh, further court cases have effectively uh, required that government uh, cannot even enter into corporate property without a warrant, uh, effectively giving them enough lead time to hide any potential violations uh, to, uh, to basic safety, health, or the environment um, uh, with advance notice. And they effectively eliminated random inspections by fire departments to make sure that uh, corporate facilities are up to code and won't happen to cause random wildfires like we happen to see a lot of times thanks to PG&E. So the impact speaks for itself as we've seen in Paradise, California, but even in uh, other places like the Gulf of Mexico, the 2010 uh, Deepwater Horizon disaster uh, was caused due to a uh, faulty safety valve that was supposed to be regulated but effectively was not and we wouldn't have known thanks to uh, the lead time that we have to give to corporations. Furthermore, the uh, Lion Air crash of the seven, uh, Boeing's recent uh, model uh, 737 uh, MAX air jet that was grounded. Uh, we aren't able to effectively inspect those planes or those properties without giving them advance notice, giving them enough lead time to hide such violations. And they don't have to reveal, uh, open their books up to uh, regulators to make sure that they aren't uh, doing uh, trade or price fixing as they are often known to do uh, between the mega cartels like our telecoms industries and such. Fifth Amendment protect constitutional rights. Corporations are also entitled, uh, thanks to one of the first environmental regulation decisions uh, that were visited by the Supreme Court back in 1922, Pennsylvania Coal Company versus Mahon, which effectively found that a regulation is a form of takings by the government. And because the government can't deprive anyone of property without uh, just compensation, it effectively meant that a corporation can demand just compensation for its lost profits from having to stop a polluting or uh, destructive practice of its business. We've actually seen the impact as far back as 1922. These were communities in Pennsylvania where Pennsylvania Coal Company was actually mining for coal under residential properties, creating these massive sinkholes that destroyed uh, people's homes, uh, roadways, and even contaminated their local water supplies until the state of Pennsylvania passed one of the first environmental ordinances that prohibited the practice of, of mining under uh, residential areas. Until Pennsylvania Coal Company sued the Supreme Court and found that regulation in fact violated their Fifth Amendment rights to takings uh, and require the state of Pennsylvania to pay them uh, in order to stop mining for coal under residential properties. And from that, we effectively can't pass a single environmental regulation basically without compensating corporations for their, lo uh, for their lost profits on that. We see the impact here even today. This was a uh, coal ash pond spill uh, in a community in Tennessee. This was uh, the Houston area um, uh, living along the coastline that was flooded right after Hurricane Harvey, uh, right near a uh, toxic chemical plant, uh, which uh, ended up catching fire and leaking uh, deadly toxic chemicals in the communities that people had to wade in through for more than a week. Uh, and then even in uh, places like Iowa, uh, abandoned coal mines are still opening up sinkholes across, like within residential communities because of the, our inability to regulate corporate pra uh, mining practices and other destructive practices in the environment. And just as a, a reminder too, if a corporation is ever convicted of violating our laws, uh, harming our communities, uh, and a jury ends up acquitting them based on the evidence because they have to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt, right? We are not able to hold them accountable if we find information after the fact because they are entitled, thanks to these Supreme Court decisions, to uh, double jeopardy protection. And they've effectively used that. Uh, Martin Lennon uh, Supply Company versus the United States, corporations were able to successfully avoid retrial in an antitrust case. Meaning that even if we were to prove uh, corporations like Google, which is facing uh, antitrust investigations in over 50, sti in 50 states now, um, if they are able to uh, be acquitted by a jury, they will be able to avoid retrial even if we find uh, evidence that they are a monopoly after the fact. There's also been, like, this Fifth Amendment right in particular is uh, incredibly harmful in that uh, the government now, governments can actually use the power of eminent domain not just to uh, provide, uh, you know, or to take property uh, for the purpose of the public benefit, but also for economic development. As we found uh, as recently as 2005 in the city of New London, um, where people were forced to give up their homes and farmland in order to uh, provide property for a private corporation to invest in business. And in the end, just uh, two years later, after the decision, uh, the corporation decided to uh, cut back on its plans 
and left the, comp uh, left the uh, uh, community to fend for itself. And of course, U.S. regulatory agencies now allow corporations to systematically violate human rights to health and safety, uh, such as the EPA that's now uh, overlooking uh, the deadly effects of pesticides and insecticides, and even rolling back decades of environmental rules and protections under the Clean Water Act and other places. Business, uh, business and profit motives are more valued than basic human rights and well-being. So, on to the First Amendment, which is one of our most sacred rights under the, uh, of freedom of speech, which allows us to even protest the government in the first place. Before 2010, uh, the Supreme Court uh, started chipping away at the Constitution and to open the door for corporations to claim First Amendment rights uh, with Buckley versus Vallejo, where they first found that political spending, the act of spending, putting money into elections or campaigns uh, is a form of protected political speech under the First Amendment. Um, this didn't give corporations the right to free speech, mind you, so that like most of the campaign finance laws that we had at the time were still in place until uh, two years later in uh, First National Bank of Boston versus Bilotti, where they found that corporate spending to influence or affect the opinions of voters uh, is effectively protected political speech. So it opened the door for corporations to spend some money and give, uh, give them directly to political parties, uh, net, like you know committees, but it still left a large, uh, it still didn't give them the explicit right to free speech. Um, but they uh, slowly started moving that direction uh, in the 1990s, uh, starting with uh, International Dairy Foods Association versus Amistoy, where they actually found that corporations, uh, dairy food uh, corporations, didn't have to disclose the fact that they were getting their dairy products from uh, cows that were being uh, exposed to bovine growth hormones, um, an illegal substance at the time, um, and it effectively gave corporations the right not to speak. So that effectively pre precludes any, right, uh, any state law that would require a corporation to disclose whether they're using genetically modified organisms within their food products and such. It wasn't until 2010 that the Supreme Court finally did away with that one remaining barrier and effectively uh, opened the door for them to claim free speech rights. Citizens United versus Federal Election Commission, where they effectively found that a corporation as an association of people that the government cannot suppress political speech based on their corporate identity. They effectively meaning corporations are people, their money is speech, and they have a right to speak as much as they want. Uh, so long, of course, as they don't coordinate with political campaigns directly. Uh, they s continue to remove what remains of our campaign finance regulation system in 2014, where they found in McCutcheon versus Federal Election Commission that the government actually has no interest in limiting corruption apart from quid pro quo corruption, basically meaning corporations giving uh, ele elected officials money for explicit favors, not just uh, the ingratiation that they might feel from getting money donated to their campaign for whatever reason. Uh, and it'll also effectively remove the aggregate limits on individual donations to political campaigns, meaning that the executives of corporations like, uh, like Monsanto, ExxonMobil, and all the other fossil fuels and big ag corporations uh, can spend up to $2 million directly to a political party or a candidate uh, alongside the independent political advocacy that their corporation can spend to support that candidate or party. But it didn't stop it for the First Amendment's free speech protections either. Same year, 2014, in Hobby Lobby versus Burwell, the Supreme Court opened the door for corporations to claim religious freedoms. Uh, only for closely owned for-profit corporations such as Hobby Lobby, basically made them exempt from laws that its owners religiously objected to. Meaning that Hobby Lobby could deny uh, its female employees contraceptive services uh, and other uh, reproductive health coverage under their employer-based uh, health insurance. and. If, uh, it uh, if this door is continued to continues to stay open, this is actually going to apply uh, not just to uh, women's uh, health coverage and women's choice uh, freedom to make <laughs> to make uh, their own decisions about their bodies, but it will actually allow for uh, certain privately owned corporations to deny um, uh, LGBTQ plus services, uh, people services. Uh, queer and trans people will be uh, could be denied services under that. People who uh, black people actually people of color could be denied uh, services based on the religious objections of its owners. And in fact, uh, in Mississippi, there was a, a recent small owned um, uh, uh, business that uh, actually denied wedding services to an interracial couple based on their religious objection.
We see the impact every day with the number of campaign finance ads uh, that are put within TV, like oppositions to popular ballot measures, uh, even advertisements for products that are directly harmful and that communities don't want, like tobacco products, advertisements for guns sell like and selling firearms, even uh, anti-unionization efforts. They're effectively allowed to influence all manners of uh, political discourse, whether it's within government or outside of government, even within our own communities. And of course, they can deny uh, basic uh, protections and services uh, to their employees uh, and people that are within the corporation based on their owner's religious objections. So what can real people do? Well, for starters, we can actually rise up and uh, take action and organize in solidarities with communities on the front lines. From Detroit, like from Detroit Michigan, uh, to Puerto Rico, to you know, Richmond, California, people have been rising up uh, uh, for more than a decade since Citizens United, but most recently here today, especially, like even, like even before then. But we really need to step out and really engage within these other movements that intersect with all these struggles, or, which, to be clear, this issue of corporate constitutional rights, corporate power in America, and how money is protected speech, uh, is not just a political issue. It's a human rights issue that intersects with every struggle for justice that's happening today. Um, and to that end, we're proposed, uh, moved to amend, our coalition is proposing the We the People Amendment, which is introduced as recently um, uh, this year as House Rent Resolution 48, which basically made clear constitutional rights belong to natural persons, human beings only, and that artificial entities, including corporations, limited liability companies, even nonprofits like ourselves, um, are, uh, are subject to regulation by the people through local, state, and federal law, and that none of the legal rights that we, uh, that we are given through state law uh, can be construed to be inherent or inalienable. It further stipulates that it is the duty of federal, state, and local governments to regulate, limit, or prohibit contributions and expenditures, basically to, for the express mandate to ensure that all people, regardless of how much money they have, have access to the political process, and that no person reg uh, uh, gains as a uh, result of their wealth uh, substantially more access or influence to the political process, effectively meaning the Mark Zuckerbergs and Michael Bloombergs of the world can't just run their own campaigns and run for president like Donald Trump did. Um, it also makes clear, too, that uh, one a common concern that we've heard from uh, people and members of Congress is that what if this affects the freedom of the press? This won't affect the freedom of the press because the freedom of the press is an individual right. Corporations, don't, like, they don't need to be a member of uh, MSNBC or uh, CNN to enjoy for, uh, press rights. So our national strategy is uh, to like, organize this movement from the ground up and build coalitions that reach out to other organizations, working on issues that are affected directly by corporate power. Basically, we need to connect the dots between the nature of corporate rule and every struggle for justice that's happening today, the issues that we care most about. So whatever your issue is um, that, that you're most passionate about, whether that be environmental justice, uh, the, agro, uh, the agroecology uh, movement, or even ending the school to prison pipeline, Make Move to Amend your number two issue, because if we can actually amend the Constitution to end this, this court-created doctrine of corporate constitutional rights and money of speech, we'll be able to level the playing field for all struggles for justice happening today. So just a few ways that you can get involved. Sign our petition, um, or you can text AMEND to 38470. Uh, also, too, consider adding uh, HDR48 as part of your strategies to transform our current systems that we have. Endorsing Move to AMEND and or the We the People Amendment uh, puts you alongside over 500 organizations, local, state, and national, that have endorsed this mo uh, movement and support uh, ending this, uh, this court-created farce of corporate constitutional rights. And tell your, con your Congress members to co-sponsor House Rate Resolution 48. We've already got 64 House co-sponsors on board. Our goal for the year is 75. We're really push it, pulling out the stops to get it introduced in the Senate. And of course, join Move to Amend if you can. Uh, we have a California Move to Amend coalition here, uh, nine to 10 uh, active affiliate groups here in the state. Uh, feel free to contact them anytime or find out where a group is nearest you. And if you have capacity, consider creating your own local group of Move to Amend. We've helped create over 150 or, uh, active uh, affiliate groups uh, in the past 10 years uh, who have actually helped to pass more than 800 local resolutions and ordinances in support of this movement, in support of the language of the We the People Amendment, including 20 state legislatures, including California, that has passed it not once, but twice. Once by the state legislature, once by uh, popular vote. And if you... Uh, 
uh, can't focus in on explicitly on move to mend work, consider uh, becoming a amendment working group where you continue your, the important work that you're already engaged in, but you're also advocating for HDR 48 as part of your strategy. That's an option, but uh, I will um, provide any information. I'm happy to answer any questions, but I unfortunately have to end. Thank you all.